Uh, I have invited them to talk uh, the Native Fish Coalition. This is the January 27th meeting of the Connecticut Council of Trout Unlimited. We are just coming to order at seven o'clock. Uh, the Native Fish Coalition has started a chapter in Connecticut. We are going to start the meeting off by hearing from them. Michael Day, I will let him introduce himself and the organization. And Michael, I am making you the host right now. It's all yours. If you are not speaking, please mute your microphones. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here before you folks. So. This is my first, um, I have a little PowerPoint presentation, so it's my first one via Zoom, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so just a, a little bit of uh, background. Um, my name is Michael Day. I'm the chair of the newly formed Connecticut chapter of Native Fish Coalition. Um, so a little bit about our organization. Um, I'm going to, I believe, share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, you should be able to. You are the host right now. Okay. Um, okay. I'm having, uh, I apologize, a little bit of difficulty. Um, sure. uh, Jack, can you just guide me? If Do I just hit um, share screen? Is click that Share correct? screen and then click on the screen you want to share. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So, um, you want to email it to me and I can uh, that that would be fine, um, or I can just go ahead and just speak to you without the. If you want to, I'll just go ahead. I, go ahead. Okay, I apologize. And then I, send us the deck. Send send me the deck, and I'll distribute it. That sounds great. Okay. okay. So uh, Native Fish Coalition, we're a 501c3 organization, and as way of background, I have some experience and time with TU. I had the pleasure of serving as the chair of conservation for the Farmington Valley chapter. And I wanna say it was a wonderful experience. I think so highly of uh, the Farmington Valley chapter and had a great time and consider all those folks uh, dear friends and I really appreciate the work we've done. So Native Fish Coalition, we have um, a very specific uh, goal and that goal is to protect, preserve and restore native fish populations. And when we speak of native fish populations, it's our thought and, and our theory that is uh, backed by science that if we restore native fish populations in waterways, they become healthier waterways. So when we speak of wild, we speak of self-sustaining or born in nature, native, indigenous, or historically present. So our goal is to protect wild native fish. We are not a fishing organization, but what we do is we try to bridge the gap between various fishing organizations, sporting and fishing groups, conservation groups, um, state and federal fish and game agencies, and so on. What, it, in the work that we do, a lot of it concerns education and information. We provide education and information. We will oppose regulation. We will support regulations. And last, we also engage in research through various scientists that partner with our organization. And ultimately, we seek to restore and reclaim various waterways. Issues that we deal with are harvest, stocking, incidental mortality, invasive fish species, pollution, and habitat. Our organization is made up of an executive director. We have a chair, a vice chair, and then each of our state chapter, um, our, our state chairmen serve on the national board. We also have an advisory council at the national level and also at the state level that's made up of various scientists, professionals that can guide us and help us with our work. 
We partner with a number of organizations um, from Patagonia, Yeti, Epic, Garmin, Sage. A lot of different organizations have supported the work that we're doing. We sell merchandise on our website. Um, and I'll give you folks our, our website address, but we sell all kinds of merchandise. All of um, the sales go back and are funneled back through our organization. Um, in our organization, we have a number of folks that have engaged in extensive writing. Principally, Bob Mallard, our executive director, writes prolifically for various organizations and various journals, um, online and otherwise. Um, he and a number of the members in our organization have also written a number of books, which are available for sale on our website. So, um, we, if you visit our website, you'll see a copious amount of information, inclu including informative uh, videos. And we're also available to speak to various chapters and organizations about specific native fish related issues. So for example, in Connecticut, native brook trout. Um, but we have presentations concerning everything from blueback, sunapee trout to Atlantic salmon and so on. Um, Another thing that's been successful in Maine, and we're going to seek to do it in Connecticut, and we're a very new chapter at this juncture, but is to engage in some sign work, providing signage at various waterways that would inform anglers and other people walking by as to the type of fish that are in a particular waterway, and specifically geared to native fish. Okay. Um, Maine was our first chapter and they've done a ton of work um, and have opposed and supported various regulations. And currently we have seven states that are um, a part of the Native Fish Coalition. We've also engaged in, in you know, active work going out um, and doing various restorative work. One project that uh, recently was done, it, we had a um, basically a um, an effort to take down various dams, man-made dams. And actually during my time with TU, um, giving credit where credit is due, Carl Swanson from the Farmington Valley chapter, um, he, myself, and a number of board members did some of that work in the Poquabic Rivershed Water Association. Um, now, in addition to this work, I, I wanted to kind of highlight how we may be able to be of assistance to other organizations and to speak specifically about a joint effort that we've engaged in with TU already. So prior to the formation of the Native Fish Coalition in the state of Connecticut, um, while during my time at the Farmington Valley um, Trout Unlimited chapter, we sought to elevate the status of the Freeman Hill Brook that some of you may be aware of. And um, this was a, a great project that we did while at TU. Uh, Carl Swanson, again, was very involved with this project. But the, far, the Freeman Hill Brook is a brook that starts just west of Sessions Woods in Burlington, goes through Sessions Woods, and terminates in the Coppermine Brook in Bristol. Now this particular waterway has copious amounts of native brook trout. As a class three stream, we've sought to elevate it to class one status. This would prohibit fish stocking in this waterway, the use of live bait, it would open the, the waterway to year round angling. And what I found interesting here is we were all able to come together. So Trout Unlimited, Native Fish Coalition and also the Connecticut Fly Fishermen Association all came together and wrote supporting letters in this effort. And interestingly, all the interests of these organizations began to align. Moving to a class one WTMA, it opens up angling year round. Um, protecting native brook trout, something that's, that's you know, part of the message that Native Fish is promoting. Um, TU, based upon TU's national policy of not stocking non-native fish over native brook trout, it was consistent with TU's interests. So I think there's a lot of room for us to partner with organizations, and we'd certainly welcome that opportunity and, and happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'll also provide Jack with my email and contact information if you think of anything and want to discuss things further. So thank you. Michael, thank you. And I think there are going to be numerous times that we can find opportunities to work together as organizations toward clean, cold water and uh, toward improving that habitat 
Any questions for Michael? Okay, hearing none, I want to thank you for coming by. Thank you and very much. Send the uh, PowerPoint around and the web link and uh, your email address. Thank you so I much certainly for coming by and welcome to Connecticut. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Take care, everyone. Thank Have you. a good night. Bye bye. Okay, with that, we will move on. Uh, financial report. Ernie, are you good to do that? Do you want me to talk about it? Ernie, you're muted. Yeah, I have all the information in front of me. How about it? Okay. Hold out, folks. All right. Uh, balance in our checking right now is 31,156 and change. Uh, the savings account has 10,000. 396 uh, and 71 cents we have, uh, which gives us a grand total of um, $42,033.24 to date. Questions? Hey, Ernie, just to confirm uh, the savings that 10,000, the, the entirety of the savings, is that the who's a tonic money? Uh, I don't believe it is. Yes, it is. It is? That the Housatonic, the Housatonic settlement money is the savings account. Oh, it is the savings account. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Looking for a motion to accept the financial report? Motion to accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Was there an opposition? No. I thought I heard an opposition. Please tell me no. <laughs> okay. Um, I was contacted the other day by, the, uh, actually, no, let me, I am jumping ahead here. Um, Ernie has become treasurer. We're still looking for a secretary. We're still looking for a vice chairman. Now, and I may ask Jeff to weigh in a little bit on this. I'm going to propose right now that we have a special meeting in March to do election of officers. Uh, a number of councils are moving their elections to March just before the April 1st beginning of the fiscal year for Trout Unlimited. So we're looking to fill those positions. Um, say again? Okay, we're looking to fill, uh, fill positions, looking for nominees for all positions. Uh, and we would, I will set a date in March for election of officers. Uh, Alicia, we need to form a nominating committee, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we will get that formed. I and the only thing, too, that I'd say is what we'll do is um, but what a lot of councils we've been helping them through is just revising their bylaws um, to to account for an, a change in the fiscal year. Um, I'll, I'll have to look specifically at Connecticut's, but a, a number of councils, their bylaws just explicitly stated that the, you know, the annual meeting would be in October. Um, and so they have to change it to, a, a lot of councils are just doing some, some standardized language that, you know, it's, it's going to be that the, the annual meeting of the membership of the council to elect officers and so on and so forth will, will align with the fiscal year of, of Trout Unlimited, you know, at a date to be set by the council, leaving it a little more broad to give some leeway, but, but realigning. So it would be a change like that. And we'll just have to uh, pay attention to noticing the members uh, in enough advance. I believe it's 30 days uh, for a bylaws change and election of officers. Do we need to adapt that bylaw tonight? No, you, 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 you can't. You, we'll need to, we'll need to need revisions. Yeah. 
I'll bounce that language off of you tomorrow when they send that out. And we could do the special meeting can be the adaptation of the bylaw and the election of officers. So, so Jeff, are you saying that the chapters need to realign their elections with the fiscal year as well? They don't need to, they could choose to. Um, okay, yeah, we've talked about it, but we haven't decided yet. Yeah, um, it, 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 it comes a little odd if, you're, if your budget year ends up running 4-1 through 3-31, and you, know, you have a, one board that's, that's setting the budget and the, and, and the next board's inheriting it for um, you know, six months. Do you need a motion to set a special meeting date for March? Uh, yeah, let's do that and we'll pick a date and I'll email. You know, let me get a March calendar. All right, well, I move to have a special meeting of the council um, in March. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 You want to do March 24th, which would be the third. That or the four, that would be the fourth Wednesday, is March 24th. March Wednesday would be good. That's fine. They're all good. Yep. All right. So we'll set a special with that. So the special meeting will be March 24th to amend the bylaws and election of officers. We'll do it at 7 p.m. on Zoom. I will send out that link along with the notice of election. Questions? Uh, John, yes, in terms of chapter elections, mm -hmm. uh, what are other chapters doing? Because, you know, we, we're not getting very good attendance at our meetings, so I'm not sure how we're going to be able to have an election. Well, we had, we, didn't we just had ours like not long ago. When are, when are we up again? Uh, we're overdue. I mean, Jeff, what are you seeing from the chapters? Well, shoot, I was going to let somebody else jump in there. Um, yes. Is that the answer? Yes, that's what we're seeing from the chapters. Um, can you jump in for him and ask it? So, so some chapters are holding elections on Zoom. Some chapters are sending a note to their members and, and postponing their elections to align with the fiscal year and using it as a chance to recruit new officers. Um, you know, you, you, you can do either. Um, you know, it's not inconceivable to do your election um, on Zoom. And, uh, you know, but. Uh, do national bylaws allow for the casting of email ballots? No, not for election like that. Um, and is, is there a quorum you have to get a, number, a certain number of votes or? Yep. Whatever your bylaws say, if they, they're different than TU Nationals, you know, typically TU Nationals, most chapters bylaws say something, the lesser of 30 members or 10% of your membership or 15% of your membership. That's what most chapter bylaws say. So, um, you know, if your chapter has 325 members, it's 33 members. So it would be the lesser, lesser number of that. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. We'll have to figure it out because we're not going to get that many people in a room. I know with Nagapomp, we've through during our board meeting, we decided to basically send a note out saying we're taking a break for the time being because the uh, Zoom meeting attendance, we're not getting more than five or six of our members. We're getting mostly non-members attending even our Zoom meetings at this point. So for him and Asset, for him and Asset, we uh, haven't been holding any Zoom meetings other than for the board of directors from time to time. Um, we did send a survey out in an email recently asking members uh, who we have emails for what they would like us to be doing. And it included a um, question about whether or not they want us to hold an annual meeting uh, for whatever reason. And uh, out of 300 and something uh, emails, we got about 10 responses so far. So all of them virtually are from the board of directors uh, so most likely we're just going to go on hiatus. Okay. Did we have a designation of acting 
um, members, so to speak, or acting people on the board for the various positions just to carry us over until we can actually have the in-person meeting with, with an adequate number of, uh, of voters? And that's, we've, we've been advising chapters is, listen, if, if, if you don't think you can pull off getting, I, I just checked the Mayanis bylaws, it's lesser of 20 people or 10% of the total membership. Um, so if you don't feel like you can get a quorum, uh, get the, the minimum number of members to do your election of officers that um, you can, um, you know, just send a good transparent note, send a letter or to, to all your members and let them know that, you know, this is our board, we've decided to kind of manage the chapter, you know, and our, our hope is that we can do an in-person event, you know, and, and uh, annual membership meeting and election in the fall or, or whatever you, you, you think for it. Just keep people, good communications is the key, right? So um, that's, that's a big part of it. Alicia, I'm replying in the chat, but no, we have not made changes since uh, 2013 that I'm aware of. Okay, then what I, I put up there is what is currently in our bylaws for our yeah. annual meeting. I realized shortly after the October meeting that we did miss the election at that one, and I brought it up to Jeff, and that's when Jeff said that some councils and chapters were changing to align with the, the new fiscal year for national. So I figured I would leave it open and have it as a discussion tonight. And, and while we're at that, I think that we should, um, and we talked about this when we, um, when we had some venue issues, when the Connecticut Forest and Park Association changed their, their uh, board meeting dates, that it, while we're at, changing the annual meeting, we should also sort of broaden our dates for our regular meetings, um, just so that we're not tied in by bylaws if we need to make a change um, due to a venue change or somebody's schedule change. Um, we should do both of those at the same time because bylaw changes are kind of a pain in the butt, so. Agreed, I think we could do that as simply as saying on or about the third Thursday of each of January, October, April, and July. Right. You just say at a date set by the executive committee with, you know, 15 days notice to the uh, we'll chapter president. The, uh, the amendments for review before the March special meeting. Any other questions or suggestions? All right, we don't need a vote on setting the meeting, so I will get that information out. And again, if anybody's interested in serving in a executive position, please let me know. Uh, Angler's Guide, we've been asked by the printer about placing an ad again. Price is the same as last year. It will be $850. Say again? We would be the only ad on the two page spread of crop regulations. Uh, we have no way of measuring the effectiveness of the last ad, except possibly a spike in membership, if anything showed up there. So the question is, do we want to spend $850 to support the angler's guide again and to get you out in front of every fisherman in the state of Connecticut. I move that we authorize the $850 ad in the uh, Angler's Guide. I second that. Discussion? Just that we, um, you know, we have not spent as much money in the last fiscal year because obviously our, you know, some of the meetings or things that we may have sponsors, sponsored didn't happen. So, you know, certainly we, we have the funds to do it. And if we can, get ourselves out there in the angler's guide with little effort, I would, I would definitely support spending that money. Thank you, Alicia. Anyone else? I agree. Uh, I, I, I can't, we can't, as you say, we can't track anything, but at Thames Valley, we have experienced in the last year plus uh, a pretty steady half a dozen increase in membership almost every month. And, uh, th this uh, 
was not happening except for several years previously. So did this ad help? I don't know. I, I'd like to think so. And I think we should definitely do it again. I hope it did. I really do. I, I just think the, the name out there is worth it. Any other comments or questions? I'm going to add to Charlie's. I'm not really sure whether it came from Facebook or from social media presence or the Angler's Guide ad or what, but I know Naugatuck Pomperog for being as small of a chapter as we are, we've seen a 15% increase in membership um, mm -hmm. in just the past year. Good. That's good. So we're getting some good news tonight, which is nice. I mean, it sounds like the location is good too. You know, being on the trout regulation page, you know, it's like the perfect location. Yeah, I talked to him about that. We were late to the party last year, did some finagling, and we were able to get that uh, get that spot. Okay, all any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I will log that as unanimous, and I will let them know right now to book the ad. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you about the regional position. Do you need the screen? I don't, no. Okay. All yours. I, I got some uh, ground turkey uh, taco stuff. Hold on. I had the same thing. Yes, but did you have otter wrap? It's not Tuesday. Did you have lettuce? No, I know, but I didn't go out to get the stuff because it was a snowstorm, so I had to keep a promise. All right. Oh. Well, I think at this point, other than uh, Nagata Komparag, uh, I've presented to every chapter and, and most of you have seen, so, um, and I sent that email update around. I know I'm getting dark here. Hold on. Hmm. Um, so more than anything, you know, um, we're closing in. I'm really hopeful we'll be able to, to post and hire for this position for the start of the fiscal year. But I, rather than do my dog and pony, um, you know, I wanted to see if anybody had any, any specific questions about goals of the position, how, how we envisioned it working, uh, thoughts you have on what you're hoping for out of, out of the position, uh, things of that nature. Is there a person you have in mind right now, Jeff? Uh, no, this will be an open. It'll be an open hiring uh, process. So we'll have to do, a, you know, a full full hiring process. We're we're hopeful to, especially uh, reach out to, um, you know, partner organizations, um, especially in some of the underrepresented communities. Uh, try to get a, a good slate. I'll tell you, I don't think it's going to be an issue. The last two jobs we've posted for at national uh, have had over two hundred applications. Um, so it's, you know, right now there's a lot of people who have, you know, significant skills and backgrounds um, reevaluating you know, what they're doing for, as a career um, and, and looking for conservation. So I think we'll, we'll get a lot of, a lot of interest um, just in, in promoting it. So. Jeff, in your, in your note that you sent out, you said that National is contributing 50, $51,000 is that per year or for the two years? That's per year. Well, those are two multi-year pledges. Um, so th that's funds we've raised for the position so far. Um, I do have other, I have grants out and things of that nature as well. Um, of that 51,000, all but 15 is a two-year pledge. We did get one, one year $15,000 uh, grant towards the position. Um, so none of it's coming from national. Well, it is. It's coming from National because we raised the funds. Um, okay. A hundred percent of the money that CU National has is is money that's raised from either donors or foundations, and, and this is how we we fund positions. Okay. We don't have an unrestricted pot of money, you know, to tap into. So every single, uh, you know, there's 240 staff positions within TU. Um, fewer than 40 of them are funded um, out of the unrestricted revenue of the organization, meaning membership dues and, and just straight up donations. The rest of them are fully funded by either uh, grants or uh, restricted uh, contributions from donors and individuals. Okay. Uh, is, that, <clears throat> is, the, um, is that like a, a yearly salary that we're looking at? 
you know, the salary would, no. So we need to raise the salaries, you know, it's, it'll be commensurate with experience, but it's, it's going to run somewhere between 38 and $55,000, probably, you know, low end to high end, um, based on experience and background, um, salary benefits, travel, um, some project implementation, you know, money probably brings it that that's where you get to the 105,000 roughly, you know, at the high end is what we, you know, we need to kind of get to. Hey, Jeff, can you, can you go over uh, how the person who is selected for the position is going to be uh, executing the, your, your five primary goals? Well, sure. like you say, um, double the number of TU volunteer led restoration projects, but how is that person, do you envision that person doing that and then, you know, kind of carry that through to the other remaining goals? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, first, first step is, is, you know, they'll be meeting with all the chapters and boards and council folks um, to find out what they currently have planned, you know, do kind of a SWOT analysis in essence, you know, with the chapters of kind of self-reporting what it is they're strong at where they have opportunities for growth uh things that they've always hoped to accomplish really get an understanding of uh where and how the chapters can um you know can grow and want to grow um with the volunteers that they have uh, assess where their skills gaps are you know some chapters uh may need more support in the communications vein some chapters may need more support in in planning you know conservation projects tree plantings trash cleanups things of that nature um, you know, uh, some chapters may need more support in fundraising. Um, it, you know, it really depend on the, the individual skills of the board. I mean, I think we all have seen that our, our own chapters all have different people on the boards who bring different skills. And, you know, our, our chapter this year may look completely different than the chapter three years ago, right? Um, so that's, that's a big part of it is kind of building the capacity of the chapters and, and understanding what, um, what each chapter, chapter needs. Um, so, you know, specific to conservation projects, you know, you know, one of the goals is that there are 50% of the chapters each year are applying for Embrace Stream, uh, whether that's for a tree planting or a conifer revetment project, you know, for small scale hands on conservation projects, um, for the most part, that also act as community engagement vehicles. Um, and, you know, in an ideal world, we, we'd be working together to target these conservation projects in communities where the chapter is currently underrepresented um, in, in ways to make sure that we're, we're engaging, you know, with those communities and, and, and building new partnerships uh, along with actually improving water quality and, and things of that nature. Um, the rest of the goals, you know, feed out of uh, all, I think more than anything, just having that consistent conduit of communication between the chapters, um, between the chapters and partners, um, both big partners like Save the Sound, Hispanic Valley Association, um, Rivers Alliance, Connecticut River, uh, I want to say Watershed Council, Connecticut River Conservancy, <laughs> um, you know, DEP and others, as well as, you know, the East Granby Land Trust and the, you know, Bolton Boy Scout group 27 and, um, you know, things that the, uh, the uh, Mill River Watershed Council Coalition, right? Um, and, you know, providing that consistent communication point. Um, and, and, and also between ourselves, um, you know, one of the things I think, I think on every single chapter conversation I've had that's been a pretty easily identifiable need is more interaction between the, the volunteers on the 14 chapter boards. Um, we all live within two hours of each other and we don't know each other. Um, you know, I mean, this group of, you know, a, a two dozen people, yeah, do we generally know each other, but um, most of our other board members, you know, I, I Rich, I was at the, uh, your name came up, we were doing our trees for trout and, and a lady came by from Westport. She's like, I've got 40 trees that didn't sell at my store. Do you need them? And, you know, the volunteer who talked to her said, I've got her information. What do you think? Should I drive to Westport and get the trees? I said, no, you should call Rich Rosen and, 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 and have her reach out to him. He said, okay, who's Rich Rosen? And I won't, I won't say his name, but I was like, you know, blank, you, you've been on our board a decade. Don't you think it, it's 
problematic that you don't know the president of the next chapter over, you know? Um, so part of it is just that those shows relationship building. And because out of that will come a lot of, you know, hopefully sharing of skills and resources and experience, um, you know, across borders, whether it's in a, you know, two or three chapter coordination or the whole region coordinating on a, a bigger thing together. That helpful, Sal? I'm not thinking dam removals and, and $200,000 conservation projects. We're talking more about community engagement through conservation. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that definitely helps. I, I was also kind of just looking at the context of, you know, what is this person going to be doing that we couldn't do without them? Uh, and also, you know, like, is this going to be another kind of step for chapters like oh we didn't contact so and so so make sure you let her know about the project and just kind of another level of another layer of complexity to, to stuff so no that, that that was that was helpful thank you yeah absolutely and, and on the contact side you shouldn't have to because that person should be at every chapter board meeting or every possible one um, you know with the position in the Pacific Northwest one of their key jobs was coordinating um, a quarterly call between all the chapter uh, presidents and conservation chairs, as well as the, the, the key staff in the region doing convenings, right? Getting everybody on the same page so that, um, you know, TU staff driven projects weren't showing up as a surprise for chapters and, and um, chapters, you know, didn't kind of reinvent the wheel on something. Um, well, I think you, what you could see here is this starts as a grassroots thing and if it advances the way it should then we're looking at dam removals and two hundred thousand dollar projects and sal i think you're right in that a lot of what this position would do is things that others are kind of doing right now without being paid but the problem is right now we're all kind of doing it. No, there's nobody who this is their job, who their job for at least 40 hours a week is to make these things happen for Trout Unlimited. I think that's where this makes a difference. It, this, that's where this elevates Connecticut and whatever else of the region this position covers has somebody who is TU and that's their job. It's not their volunteer thing. It's not what they're trying to find time to do. They're facilitating what we do. They're handling the things we don't have time to do. And that's why I think this is important. Say it certainly would have been beneficial had a person been in that position while uh, the Hammond chapter was trying to deal with the Pages Mill Pond Dam Fishway. Right. Uh, there would have been a whole lot more coordination with uh, TU National in a way that um, was more difficult for us than I would have liked. I didn't communicate adequately and uh, the feedback was not as uh, um, clear um, about what we were doing right and doing wrong uh, as it could have been. So I think having that person here would have really been helpful. Other questions for Jeff? Yeah, I, I just add that, you know, I think it's a pretty big area uh, for one person to cover. And I, I just hope, you know, the chapters in New York and, you know, some of the smaller chapters who aren't, you know, doing big projects going on or something are, are given just as much attention by this person. Because I, I definitely think they have a geographic uh, hurdle in front of them to get over because it is a big area with lots of chapters uh, doing stuff. And I hope some of the smaller chapters get the same amount of, of attention going forward, but they'll have some yeah, on their hands, I'm sure. No, absolutely. And, and I kind of view it, um, you know, more as a, 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 that's another resource, right? So some of the chapters, um, Mianus, New York City, Croton, Long Island, um, for instance, nut, Nutmeg, the resource they have the easiest access to and the most of is, is financial wealth uh, and demographic density. Um, chapters like Columbia Green, Rip Van Winkle, or Mid Hudson, or Northwestern, or, or you know, Thames Valley, the resource they have is lots of clean, protected, old, 
native trout waters, right? Um, they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of people, but they've got, got the purpose of our organization. And it, it, it's about aligning and, and, and recognizing how those resources can be brought together. Um, you know, uh, I, I think of the way, you know, when we did the, the temperature study on uh, Coopers and Anguilla Brook, right? Uh, you know, the down county chapters contributed financially to those projects. The, the eastern chapters managed the project and provided the volunteers to, to do it, right? And it was kind of a win-win um, in, in those cases. Um, so, but yes, Sal, absolutely. I was, by the way, I was, uh, I went to the highest point in Rhode Island over the weekend, uh, Jeremiah Hill, uh, a full 810 feet, uh, with I think you get 89 feet of elevation gain over a 0.3 mile walk, um, uh, just because we wanted to do it. And, you know, as I'm driving out there, all I was looking at is two hours across Connecticut were opportunities for places for community engagement events and activities. Um, and, and there's loads of them. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a that's a big part of it is how can we do more, you know, family friendly. Hey, Jeff, don't don't event. don't diss the uh, the height of all those mountains in Rhode Island. I learned to ski in Rhode Island. <laughs> you, you turn left once and, and and then get on the chairlift. Was this was this cross country or downhill, Rick? <laughs> it was downhill. It was this little <laughs> this little thing that the the only lift they had was a rope tow. They <laughs> didn't even have a chair. <laughs> yeah, Pine top mountain. Pine the, the, top. Exactly. The second, the second tallest hill is probably a landfill. Right. It may or may not be true. Uh, yeah. Another thing, I just in in thinking about this and and hearing your your question, Sal. And uh, and tying in what Rick said here, you know, with someone in that position, there would be accountability. And if they're not in touch with national, if they're not providing the information and support we need, then we tell Jeff and that's dealt with. Right now, if it's done on a volunteer basis and your volunteers aren't showing up for uh, – projects or they're not showing up for meetings or they're not attending zoom meetings there's you know they're volunteers your accountability is limited whereas if this position is approved there's an accountability built into that that i don't think we have right now and i think it shows in some places yeah i think having that accountability would definitely be good or some metrics to to kind of for jeff to keep track of to make sure that a person is reaching out to the chapters and seeing those goals kind of across their geographic area uh, would help. I mean, uh, Jeff, I think the only thing that I might like to see on that position goals would be uh, some kind of support for policy and legislative issues, not necessarily having them be the voice, but if a new bill or something comes up, new stormwater regulations that it's not, you know, the folks of individual chapters only trying to collect information and put something together uh, all on their own. It would definitely be help out if we could have someone maybe in this position say, hey, let me reach out to TU and get you some information to support your letter or signatures or something. So yeah, uh, that, that, that kind of conduit of, of you know, connecting, connecting volunteers to the resources is, is a big thing. Um, uh, and, and advocacy is right up, the, right up in that one. There's know, a bit of an you. overlap there, Sal and Jeff in an item that's coming up on the agenda that might further address that, Sal, and allow this position to work on the projects, et cetera. But I, I hear where you're coming from there. Yeah, I was thinking about all the work, uh, John, that you and I did for, you know, the, the, the stormwater regulations oh. and some of the solar stuff. And it was, yeah. you know, you and I run around trying to read legislation and, you know, hearings before Pura and stuff. Like it, it was, took a long long time to go through that and if we could have had some assistance right we maybe could have had a more effective response uh to those things but we had to split our time and make sure we hit those timelines so thank you Can I, just For say, what it's worth, I, I have i i do have some concerns about over promising for this position i mean as someone who does just statewide in connecticut 
you know, not even responsible for specific chapters, but certainly serving watershed organizations across the state, it's an awful lot to do development, policy, um, and, and, you know, fundraising and, and everything else all in one person. So I think we need to be, if we want some sort of accountability for this person, we have to have a realistic expectation of what this person can do across Connecticut and part of New York. It's because, you know, first of all, you're probably, unless this person's super person, um, it's, that's a whole lot to ask of one person. It's a lot. Yeah. And, and thank you, Alicia, for that. And, and the expectation is not that they're a specialist in every field, um, that, that they're able to connect uh, chapters with each other and chapters with, with other resources at CU National to fill those skill gaps, right? So they don't need to be the advocacy specialist, but they can get the early indicator of a need for advocacy support and get Kate Miller from our government affairs office on the phone to work with the chapter on a specific issue or elevate it, you know, or if a chapter is doing a conservation project, you know, and planning it, connect them with Tracy Brown and, 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 and find a way to have her support that, that project, right? Whether it's, it's doing the engineering part of it or um, helping with the permitting process, right? Um, it, it's those kind of things. But yeah, absolutely. And, won't be. and one other reality check, as far as, and I apologize to many of you, I know you work really hard, but there's just been a lot of times where, um, you know, progress isn't always welcome or a change in a way to do things to maybe raise more money or expand your membership. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, another reality check is, is this person going to be able to get some chapters to to you know move beyond their comfort zone to do what needs to get done to to raise money in a different way to look beyond you know for some chapters it's even you know accepting credit cards um and, and that's just a, like a random example but um but i just it's another concern of mine that it's that's going to be another barrier that's very going to be very difficult for someone whether they're a volunteer or a paid paid staff person for what it's worth, I've got a, a fair amount of confidence in the current TU uh, staff that we've dealt with, that they, they have the ability to manage a position like this effectively and do all the HR stuff and make sure that the person's doing their job and have whatever metrics are necessary. I, I really don't have um, concerns uh, that that won't be done. I mean, I'm sure it will be. I agree with Rick. Uh, yeah. and, and Alicia, just real quick to that point, though, about, you know, because first and foremost, I view the, the position as a capacity building position, you know, and the, the hope would be like in a case like that, the, the expectation for, for the movement for that chapter drops from must host 10 conservation projects and 20 youth education programs and a thriving veteran servicing and raise $20,000 to develops a one page strategic plan this year. That, you know, that's the goal and identifies two new potential leaders who fill specific skill gaps, right, um, for that chapter and marshals the support of the neighboring chapters to help in other ways, right, um, with, with a few things um, would, would be kind of, I think, where, where, where it has to go because you're right, you can't, it, 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 it I know what, what you've run into and what I've also run into before as we, as we work with recalcitrant uh, board members. So, Jeff, what exactly do you need from us tonight? Well, I've, I've put a proposal out with a request for, for $5,000. I'd hope for a vote on it. If you'd rather wait till March, uh, that's fine as well. Um, but, uh, it, you know, the big thing for me is you know, I, I have to have 80% confidence in the salary funding before I can post the position. So that's, that's why I need to kind of get my ducks in a row um, so that I can go to Chris and say, okay, this is, this is where we're at. Um, and, you know, the expectation is we're going to have a, you know, a, 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 a golf and fishing tournament in July that will close the, close the remainder of the, of the unrestricted salary gap for the year. Okay. 
Can I get a motion for the $5,000 for the regional position? I make a motion. Who I'll seconded that? that? All right, who made the motion and who seconded? I did, Jack. Thanks. And I seconded it. Rick Huntley from Hammonasset. Is that a one-year one commitment or a two-year commitment? I'd prefer two, but one is fine. Uh, so <laughs> 5,000, 5,000. Jeff, 5,000. So that's the motion is 5,000, 5,000. John, you keep breaking up for me. Right. Um, for the minute, if everybody can mute themselves, you should be okay so that we get the motion verbiage as we want it. Bear with me a second while I try to fix this. Jack, you're good. Okay. So the motion, and I will put it in the chat to everyone. All right, in the chat window is the motion as written with the new information. Butch, you still want to move that? Rick, you still want to second that? Yes. Yes, I'm fine with seconding that. Other discussion? All in favor? What? I'd, I'd be interested in seeing how it works out for the first year before we give 5,000 for the second year. I mean, what, what, where's this, where's the 5,000 coming from, from the, the council? Like what, what's our income stream that that money is coming from? Well, we need to have a council fundraiser, which is something that's been lacking for years and was the next item. And I think it's something we need to, seriously start to plan we're held back by held back by covid and what did, we can do so did we bring in five thousand dollars this year from some revenue stream i would have to look back at uh i would have to look back at the uh financials that i i can do that right now if you'd like our primary financial stream is the TU rebate, which is about a little over $6,000 a year. I'm not sure why the previous fiscal year was about 3000 It might be because of the change in fiscal year. I think the dates might be wrong. I believe you were. Yeah, that, that was uh, for the six-month fiscal year. It was uh, half rebate, 125 on the hill. Uh, I tend to agree with Sal. Uh, I mean, I think the position is really important, but at the same time, if we're getting 6000 from national, then sending 5,000 back for the position. I think that's a really big commitment without us having some other revenue stream to bring money in. And then on top of that, we're promising it out two years instead of one year uh, when we don't even know what the revenue stream is for that second year either. Well, I think one way around that would be to revise the motion to assess the performance after the first year, or you could vote against the motion. I, I think those would be the two options. Anybody keep else? In mind, keep in mind, we only have $31,000. So this is nearly a sixth of our total budget of what we currently have. Right? This is no small chunk. 
No, it's no small chunk, but what is it that we're supposed to be doing with the 30,000? Yeah, we're, there yeah, other we're ideas trying to hold for what to do with that money. Yeah, we feel like we need to hold a fundraiser. We do. So, but no, I'm, I, my question was that it's been stated that we have only $30,000, but what are we planning to do with that $30,000? Do we have projects that need it? Do we have specific ideas for where it should go? Here's something that's concrete that could help all of us quite a bit. And even if we didn't make anything in the second year, it would still only drop us to $20,000. Excuse me, but uh, at one point, uh, in the past we've had uh, both legal and uh, political uses for council funds and reason to have some backup money there, not knowing or knowing what may came up, come up in legislature. I, I would suggest that 20,000 would be enough for now. And hopefully we'll have a fundraiser and get the extra 6,000 from uh, the next fiscal year from you know the TU rebate. Um, so unless, unless we're really, in my opinion, thinking that there's something else on the horizon, I think this is the wise use of the money. I think if, if, if chapters have increased fundraising because of this position, that would help support it as well. So I think there are untapped fundraising sources that we can open up. We can look at uh, possibly some reimbursement as well, you know, where we are with certain reimbursements for events, et cetera. I've been away from these numbers for, for a long time. A lot of you guys don't even know me. I used to be council chair way back when. Well, um, I, the, 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 uh, real quick before we right. vote. introduce yourself, Bill. And oh, you I'm sorry, Bill Bluffus. I'm sorry. I thought you guys knew that from. No, I'm my there are some new people here, so I'm saying let's just do. Sure, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm all for it. Sure. Uh, you know, I don't know where you know. It, I remember way back when we had. Well, first of all, we've never had a fundraiser, and we didn't spend a lot of money. And at one point, because we weren't spending any money elsewhere, we were giving money back to the chapters. Then we, then going over, I don't know, last 10, 15 years, we started spending money, giving money from the council revenue, which, as Alicia correctly stated, is from the rebate from national, what, two bucks or whatever for every member in the, in the, in the, uh, in the in state. And we've been sending people uh, or subsidizing chapters who've been sending people to the um, uh, regional uh, meetings. Uh, and, the, and the motivation for doing that was it was leadership development. Uh, so that's kind of an important ongoing thing that I've been aware of. Um, my, my feeling is that this position, I think, is very good and could lead to good things. It's a matter of how, do, how does the council uh, pay for it. Uh, and justify it on an ongoing basis once you get satisfied with whatever happens in the first year. Uh, the, uh, 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 it, it, you know, it, I think a, a budget probably needs to be made if not one doesn't exist. And again, excuse me if I don't, if I'm not current on it, as to what our, what that income is, it's about 6,000 bucks or $8,000 a year. And, and what that goes to, what's important. Um, the, you guys passed a, uh, a measure to uh, put an ad in the in the anglers guide, which I which we talked about many many years ago. And I'm really happy to hear that happen. Uh, I think that's got to probably pay for itself pretty much. Um, so you know, where do you get the rest of the money from? Maybe it comes down to getting a, a couple hundred dollars from every chapter to help subsidize these things. If you don't do a fundraiser, um, but I I don't I don't know necessarily if you need to if you really want to take a look into the twenty thousand dollars because like Charlie McCautry mentioned, uh, there's a certain ought to be a certain amount of of holdover <laughs> monies that are for big things like like uh, lawyers uh, if you need that which you can't you can't project that you can't budget for that uh, so it seems like if you're going to have a a, a person a professional to help staff 
uh, uh, the Jeff, Jeff Yates position, as well as two of the other things, it seems like that ought to come out of your annual revenue and not, not dip into the $20,000 per se. Kind of to your points, Rick. Yeah, Bill, I, I appreciate all of that. And uh, the individual chapters are contributing separately toward the position. At least Ham and Asset has voted uh, to expend some of our existing funds, meager as they are, uh, in hopes that we'll actually be able to raise some more and um, uh, do better things in the future. Personally, I'm highly skeptical about about spending, you know, five thousand a year when that's what our total council expenditure was last year. You know, we're going to double our council expenditure, um, and I. I'm skeptic, also skeptical about how, you know, what the the actual end benefit is going to be to the chapters financially, you know, in, um, you know, I know that the part of this position is supposed to assist with fundraising and, and whatnot, but I, I question how, how, how effective it's going to be for both chapters and for council. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, based on the roster of people in the participants window, I'm going to go down each person by how you're identified, introduce yourself and your chapter. And if you don't have anything to say, you don't have anything to say. If you want to comment on this, comment on this, and then we'll put it to a vote. So, Alex, we'll start with you. Okay, Jack. Um, Alex Zemkevich from Nutmeg Chapter. Um, I think my view would be to commit the 5,000 for the first year and uh, with the potential to commit another 5,000 year two, but, you know, depending upon, you know, having another vote, you know, next year to see you know, was it really worth our while or not to, to expend the funds? Thank you. So agree to one continued con second year would be contingent upon seeing some real, real benefit to the chapters and to the council. Thank you, Alex. Charles? You're talking to me. Yeah, and if you have anything to say, say it now. Introduce yourself and... Uh, <laughs> Charles McCartney, Thames Valley. Uh, I believe I had my say. I, I think we need to protect. I uh, I, I agree to go uh, the five thousand this year and and to have a look see for the second year. Carl Peterson, anything else? Um, uh, nothing else to add. I mean, I'd be opposed to at this point to, to expending more than two thousand dollars for the first year and waiting to see what the second, you know, what that return was or what 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 the outcome was before making any sort of commitment for the future. Mike Carl, uh, am I muted? I'm muted. No, you're not. I hear you. Okay, uh, Mike Carl, Thames Valley membership chair. I'm relatively new to the council stuff. I'm, I'm not a financial guy. I'm not a business guy, but um, I think it's worth the investment. Um, I, you know, uh, I kind of like in some things, uh, we've had this discussion with our own individual chapter, we, and we um, donate some money. Um, you know, it's like holding on to an old car, you know, you know, you're just going to drive it and drive it and drive it until it breaks and it costs you twice as much money afterwards. You know, everybody's financially strapped. Everybody's time-wise strapped. Um, COVID has definitely hurt everybody. But if uh, we don't invest in something in the future, um, we're going to have to pay double it later down the road. Thank you. So why not start now? Thank you, Mike. Rich Rosen. Uh, Rich Rosen, not make chapter. I am also hesitant to commit for a second year. I think we can we can stretch and do the first year and see how it goes. 
and uh, that would be where I would stand. I think that's it's a big chunk of money. And we don't, as, as somebody said before, we don't have a lot coming in. Uh, and we still have to talk about the, the council fundraiser and where that and what that would be used for, why we're doing that. Well, I would think for this, um, in a big, in a big part. Yeah, as long as it doesn't co confuse us with the other, with the chapter fundraiser. I think steps will be taken. We'll discuss that. Uh, uh, right. Butch, Butch, okay, Jay. Yeah, this is me, Jim Buchak. I'm a uh, member of Farmington Valley, a uh, new board member, by the way. Um, I agree with the five thousand dollars a year, and I do agree with Alicia. I don't, I don't have the uh, scope of service this this position would require, but it does sound like it's a lot. So my only concern is, you know, the first year would be a learning curve for this person, so it may not be a valid assessment at the end of the year of year one. It's going to take a little while for this person to get grounded, but. Um, I agree we should spend the money for the 5000 at least for the first year. Butch. Jack, um, Milt Buckta, everybody knows, most, most people know me as Butch, uh, Board of Directors of Minus Chapter, TIC Coordinator for TI Minus Chapter. I definitely agree with going with the 5000 the first year and possibly looking into it the second, but the way things are going, we I think we should do a fundraiser. Um, what sort of thing is, would it be, have to be brought up by the chapters or by the council? But uh, I think both years should be uh, honored to get this thing going forward. Thanks, Butch. Carl, not Carl Peterson, the other Carl. Yeah, Carl Swanson from uh, Farmington Valley, Vice President. Um, yeah, you know, I got a couple things to say on here, and if I get too long, John, cut me off. Uh, first off, you know, unfortunately, Jeff, we're hitting a perfect storm here. <laughs> you know, this is probably the worst time you could bring this up, but I think it's, I think it's a, a, a valuable position. I mean, I, the, the chapters definitely got to start talking to each other more. We don't, we don't do nearly enough. Now, whether that's a fault of this council here or not, I'm not sure. But in any case, yeah, there's no communication between between the chapters. And, and that and if this position is going to help that, by all means, and if it's going to help us organize some of the uh, other chapters that may not be a, uh, uh, efficient in, in, you know, processes, whether it be fundraising projects or whatnot, I mean, it, it's all good that said i'm also not a proponent of chapters or councils sitting on large sums of money i, I, I don't see the object of sitting on li large sums of money um yeah you need a little bit in the back for you know i whether we got to, you know, get lawyers for a project or to save ourselves i mean i think the council needs to set maybe a minimum amount that we keep in our bank, say at fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. So, you know, if we're sitting on thirty, I think five thousand could definitely be uh, allocated for at least one year to see how it goes. And then, you know, and who knows what 2021 is bringing. I mean, you know, uh, we might have a great fundraiser where we can automatically say, bing, we can we can improve for a second year. But um, at this point, I would say going forward with one year and then seeing how it goes for a second year. Thank you, Carl. David Ader. So I certainly would go for the first year. I'm inclined to also commit to the second year. You know, we're coming off this, this virus. It's been a tough year, obviously. And everything everyone said that we need better coordination. But I think this is a, supporting this is going to be a real statement uh, to, to the members statewide. And I think it's a very important position that we need to do something. I, too, agree. The money is there for a purpose. Um, so certainly the first year, but uh, if I'm, I know I'll be in a minority in this one, but I would also say let's let's commit to the second year, and perhaps if we just do a review of it, um, you know, early in the next year, we can go along with that. But I do think this is an important position, and it gives us something to say to go out to all the members to show that you know the, that TU is doing something within the state. So I'm thumbs up. Thank you, David Ernie. Well, I basically kind of agree with everybody else. I I think the first year, yeah, I think we should do it, see how it plays out, and decide at that point whether or not it makes sense to go forward for the second. John Divineer. 
Yeah, I'm the president of the Felon Combat Chapter. Um, Jeff made a good presentation to us a couple of months ago. Uh, unfortunately, like uh, Carl said, we're in the middle of uh, the perfect storm. We didn't have a fundraiser this year. We're not going to have a fundraiser next year. Same time, we have uh, financial commitments to other organizations that we donate to. Um, so we had to uh, we had to vote no. Um, so it's, you know, it's an excellent position, and uh, we certainly like to see it go. Um, I think if the council has the money uh, for the first year, that, you know, go ahead and, and, and make the donation. Um, if you've got to raise funds for the second year, then you should have your fundraiser, see what you come up with, and then determine if you can do it again for the second year. But uh, for the first year, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a good idea, especially uh, the council has the money. So that's all. Gary Lucier. Um, I, I would vote to approve the 5000 for the first year, and I would earmark the second 5000 for the second year budget uh, contingent on a vote and an approval, you know, for the second year expenditure. Um, you know, as we were talking about some of the cash flows and, and revenue streams and expenditures, it got me thinking, I mean, I've, I've seen... I've seen financial statements with our balances, but do does the state council even have a budget for the plan spending for the year? Do, do we do one of those at the beginning of the year and figure out what it is we're going to spend? Because every you know, it seems like every time we meet, there's a couple hundred dollars for this, couple hundred dollars for that. Do we have a plan budget that we try to stick to? I think that would be a good idea for the council to have if we don't. I think we need to have that. We haven't for some time, but we do get unforeseen requests from chapters, et cetera. Uh, and we should be ready for those, but we do need to budget that out. Pat Gaynor. Oh yeah, I'm uh, Dane Valley, Jeff, uh, fundraising committee. I agree with the first year and uh, see how it goes on the second. And I'm hoping uh, this spring that maybe the country will start opening up, that we can get back out there again and uh, start doing some more fundraising. So that's my view on the whole situation. Alicia. So my, um, you know, I definitely appreciate what, what uh, Jeff has said about, um, you know, only having so many unrestricted funds, but I've always been vocal with National about their lack of investment in, in volunteer, supporting the volunteers, um, because, you know, we work to bring in the membership funds. Um, they use our hours to leverage grant funds um, and for many years. And, and certainly we can't go back and, and redo things, but um, TU wasn't taking enough in overhead um, and got themselves into financial issues. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to look at this and think that we're gonna end up spending 90% of the kickback we get from national um, to, to invest in support we should be getting from national in the first place. I am not going to oppose a, a first year. And can you guys still hear me? Because I'm having a real bad connection yes. issue. Yes. You all froze on me. <laughs> this is what I get for bragging about how good my Wi-Fi was since we got the mesh system. Um, I, I'm not going to oppose anything, but um, I think I, I will abstain. Um, and um, I will also volunteer for the budget committee. I'm a geek and I love doing budget stuff. So. Beth Peterson. I... Uh, president of Naugatuck Pomparag. Um, I'm kind of at the same school as far as let's invest in the first year and see what happens from there. Um, unfortunately, we learned this year, unforeseen circumstances happen. We have no idea what might come up the pike. So if we can invest and like Gary said, earmark it for next year, but make that contingent on a vote and an approval, Honestly, I think that's our best option at this point. Gerald. Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, I'm Gerald Barifati. I'm a uh, board member with the Mayanis chapter. Um, you know, I think that this position is uh, really important and uh, it's really, you know, the connection that, you know, this person would, um, bring between the chapters in terms of, you know, doing fundraising and conservation projects and really just serving as a liaison and uh, increasing communication because it seems to be, um, you know, an issue that we've been talking about tonight. Um, you know, I seem to agree with everybody else that, uh, 
you know, the 5,000 up front in the first year, I think, is a good idea. And, uh, you know, kind of regrouping and having another discussion about it for the next year is probably um, beneficial. Um, but I know it's also a big number, but, you know, some, based on from uh, what other people have been saying, you know, if we have the money, um, I, it would probably be wise to spend it. And there's multiple new ways of fundraising. Um, I know later, you know, in the, uh, on the agenda, we still have to talk about fundraising, but uh, that's basically it. I think it's a good idea, but it's definitely something that we should uh, regroup on and talk about for the next year as well. Thank you. Sal, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Alicia said. I mean, I think that overall this position uh, should be something that would hopefully have been coming from national, you know, without having to come to the chapters for support. Uh, I mean, I, th I was a little surprised when national came back to us and asked for EAS, uh, contributions this year after we were awarded some uh you know there's when you look at the when you sit at some of the national meetings and look at the tu national budget you know in the millions of dollars and you know all this conservation funding for every dollar you know goes to conservation uh you know you kind of hope that some of that stuff uh would, would come back to us a little easier uh and it's just it seems like we have to, like Alicia said, we got to fight for every penny we can get, uh, but, and then we're asked to put two more back in. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's a good it's a good position, uh, but you know, I, the most I could uh, possibly support at this point would be that first year, and then we'd have to see some kind of cost benefit from this to fund the second year. So we just aren't throwing good money after bad without actually seeing something in return. But like I said, if the if you know it works out great and we have the benefits from it coming through that first year, then by all means let's go forward and do the second year. But you know I'm always hesitant to just throw money out there without seeing any any kind of return or any kind of indication that works going on. Uh, so I just would be much more comfortable seeing something like that. Uh, and as far as other folks have said about the budget, like Gary had said with Thames Valley, uh, I think having a budget is very important. So we can figure out where the money is going to go and if we want to have savings and how much, but without that, it's kind of hard to plan when some of these things come up, uh, especially when we're talking about large sums of money compared to our council income. Jim Woodruff. I, I support the, given the 5,000 for both years. I mean, I think it's a uh, good use of our money. That's all I got to say. Kevin Fuller. Oh, um, well, I missed uh, the beginning of the presentation and I'm not sure what the position details are exactly, but um, I've been uh, treasurer um, for a number of years here and uh, we do have like a $6,000 income every year. 90% of that goes back to chapters and, and for our, um, annual meeting and regional meeting reimbursements. So we're not gonna be spending that this year. And we've, been, we've had $30,000 in the bank for the last 15 years. So I, don't, I think that's a good investment. Is there anyone else? Can I just add in one extra thing? I mean, I know I already spoke, but um, my career is in, is in emergency medicine and the volunteer side is dying off by in the droves. Everything has to go to paid or partially paid. You, you just can't get help nowadays unless you pay for it. And you can't make money unless you spend a little money. I know it's 5,000 and 5,000 is a lot of money coming from one council, but you know, there's, there's, there's no more volunteers, you know. That's all I, I mean, that's all I have to say. All right, I will uh, go last and then we'll see if Jeff has any response. Uh, my feeling is that we should uh, approve the 5,000 for this fiscal year and the 5,000 for the next fiscal year. I think Kevin hit on a very good point. Uh, most of our money is spent 
on travel reimbursements and those meetings aren't happening. So that's going to be money unspent. Um, is there money and that we didn't have time to look into it tonight? Could some money come from that Housatonic uh, GE settlement if some work is done for that? Could that offset some of it? Uh, there will be fundraising. We do need to have uh, a, some kind of a robust fundraiser for the council that we have not had in years, um, if ever. I think this is an important position to get us on better ground. Okay, I've been told we cannot use money from the Housatonic Fund, so we that scratch that idea. I'm just spitballing here because I'm hearing a lot of what we can't do, and, and I'd like to try to, I've always tried to work with what we can do. I would- Jack, to move this forward. Go ahead. To move this forward a bit, as uh, the person that seconded the motion, I would consider um, uh, the amendment saying it's uh, 5000 for the first year with a uh, dedication of the 5000 for the second year subject to an additional vote uh, as a friendly amendment. Butch, do you accept a friendly amendment? Yes, because I'm looking at this also. In 2020, TU National gave you X. We didn't spend that X. Nobody went to any regionals. Nobody went to national in 2020. And there's nothing going on for regional or national for 2021. So basically, there's 10 grand right there. We have it. Use it. But you're okay with raising yes, this? I'm okay with that. 5,000 now, and we have to approve the other 5,000 one year from now. Perfect. Or whenever Jeff needs it. Jeff, mm -hmm. can you work with that? Absolutely. Um, all right, the motion is... Move the question. Mo all in favor of moving $5,000 now to national for the regional position and assigning $5,000 pending a vote next January. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Fundraising, I don't know how much we need to get into details. I was just going to bring up the need for a council fundraiser and something different that doesn't step on the chapters because my biggest fear is that the council does some kind of fundraiser and undercuts one of its own chapters. So hopefully we can uh, avoid that. And I think it's something I think we need to look into a fundraising committee. I think at the March meeting, uh, we look at a committee, uh, forming a committee on that once we have a slate of officers in place for the coming year. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I would just say that, you know, I agree with the folks who are calling for a budget because um, if you want to set fundraising goals, you really want to know, you know, what your, your, what expenses you're trying to cover. Um, just so at least you can set some realistic goals and and something where you'll be able to, you know, sort of understand you know, what you'll be able to do and what you won't be able to do. And and also if, if there's a particular project, um, as far as fundraisers go, it's very easy to uh, raise funds on a project basis. So, um, you know, letting people know where their money is going to go if they if they you know either you know, bid on something in a, a, an online auction or, um, you know, give during a giving day, um, it'll be helpful. So um, I just, just a thought. I think we do that going forward. Are there back budgets from when you were chairman that we can consult? No, I don't think we ever had a budget. Okay, well, we'll start doing um, that. We'll start Bill, doing Bill brought office, was there a budget when you were in? Maybe gone. gone. I think we did. There was not one for Bill. Uh, Jerry Bannock didn't have a budget. Uh, Jim Golanka and I, when I was in LC, and Ted Gisdell and I, um, Chair, didn't have budgets either. So I think we, it, it's something we can do. But let's yeah. let's get, let's have a meeting in March, get a slate in place, and and then tackle all these things. 
moving on, communications. I had talked about redesigning the CT uh, trout site. I am going to wait, and Jeff, you can brief us a little bit on this. There's templates coming out that chapters and councils can use. Yeah, our, our, our comms team is rebuilding all the chapter websites in WordPress um, so that it's a good open source platform. Um, right now, they're launching a, a, a major uh, digital version of Trout uh, next month, but this is the next project on their queue. So it, it affords waiting. Um, you know, at the same time, too, with the regional coordinator coming in, potentially having good communications and conversations between the chapters, you know, it may make sense, you know, as we all move forward and discuss for the council and the chapters to, to align around one, one website, you know, with, with different or one web, website template and design with one different platform. websites for each chapter. Um, you know, a number of councils do that where the council and the chapters share the same kind of website and resources. There's, there's a lot of benefits to that being, you know, probably the chief ones being consistent messaging, look and feel, um, shared calendars so that everyone sees everyone's events and activities and they can coordinate and, and, and members can go to one event one week and a different event the next week across chapter borders. And probably the biggest one that, that we've seen within our department is uh, the situation when the webmaster uh, passes away or moves to Arizona and the chapter website doesn't get updated for two years because no one knows how to log in and do it. If we have one consistent, you know, website or platform used across the state, um, there's nine other people who are already trained who can help support um, a new volunteer in that chapter get up and running. Um, but that, that I would say on that one, it's, you know, Right now, it, it's probably a, a lower priority uh, for most chapters. I know Farmington, Carl, you guys just launched an absolutely stunning website. Um, you know, Candlewood Valley just redesigned theirs. Mayanis did theirs 18 months ago. Um, and I think we're, um, we're on three different platforms. Um, so there may not be a lot of appetite to, to tackle it, but we can always pull it in piece by piece as well. So my plan, unless anybody objects, is I'm going to wait for the template to come from National, and then we will redo. And as I've said, I do want, in a way, to address some of the communications issues that were raised in the prior discussion, to have all of the chapters feed to one site, to one hub. I think that will save a lot of, uh, of stress. On an unfortunate and unrelated note, and I'm going to bring this up, uh, I'm not going to single a chapter out. There was a post on a chapter site last weekend that took shots at uh, women anglers, that took shots at uh, the DEEP for not having people to enforce, and it was totally un inappropriate. And that's how I spent my Saturday night was uh, emails and texts, uh, some of which were not uh, yet responded to uh, to get that taken down. I have sent to everyone on the email list the ethics and social media uh, policies from TU. I'm not going to waste our time reading them because you have them, but I would suggest you go over them with your communications people and that you uh, have people check what's posted on your Facebook pages because that was potentially a very embarrassing had it stayed up longer and more people saw it. It was completely inappropriate. It flies in the face of what this organization stands for. It flies in the face of what the council stands for under my chairmanship. And to be honest with you, I'm still pissed off about it. And it's not happening again because it, because it reflects on me because my name's on this council. Period. Let's move on to Jim for a uh, TIC update. Jim, I hope you got happier news. <laughs> well, uh, every day was a great success because we, luckily we had really good weather. Uh, it went fast because we weren't allowed in the schools. We just did a handoff at the door. I know in my chapter, I'm not sure whether. And we have eggs hatch, hatching as of last week. So, considering the uh, year we had, I, think I saw one on. You posted on Facebook a photo of the uh, hatch, right? 
Uh, no, I didn't. I don't okay. post much on Facebook. <laughs> Farm, Farmington Valley posted it, but yeah, we're all, I think all the schools are hatching at this point. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say thank you to Jim and to everybody involved because I know, unfortunately, Courtney missed you guys at the lot where they picked up, but everything was figured out and she was able to get what she needed where she needed and we just appreciate just the communication and we realize that we were kind of behind the ball. We were wondering where those eggs were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim and everybody involved, thank you very much because you keeping this program going under the most difficult circumstances it's ever faced. My hat's off to you. Great job. It all goes to the teachers. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to everybody involved with that. And you know what we should, we'll thank the teachers and everybody else involved. Uh, Fisheries Advisory Council. The big news coming out of that is our friend Bill Hyatt, who is now on the FAC, since he's retired and has time, um, they are reviving the legislative committee. <clears throat> I am on that now. Uh, Mike Piquette is on that now. And uh, the general tasks are to monitor Connecticut legislative activities uh, related to fisheries and some federal concerns, uh, inform the FAC chairman and membership of any issues, make recommendations, collaborate with other fisheries organizations, uh, promote awareness and support for Friends of Connecticut sportsmen, really to kind of bring everybody together. Um, so tasks for 2021, there are three that Bill has come up with. Um, one is really one that we need to work on, that he's looking for some help from us. And that is, and it ties in beautifully with the Rivers app. And we can do training. I would like to do statewide training on the Rivers app to develop a citizen science-based program to advance the conservation of cold water and headwater streams. So what we would do is basically what the Rivers app asks us to do for TU, but it would feed to another database as well so that the towns and the NGOs would know where the problems are and what needs to be dealt with. And I think this is something that can really increase our visibility and really take advantage of the boots on the ground. And it's just as simple as the Rivers app. You're out, you're fishing, you see something, you take a photo of it, bang the coordinates in, and it's logged with the proper departments. Hmm. Also on the agenda for the legislative committee is uh, allocating state bonds, getting state bonds allocated for the fish, fish, uh, fish passage on the Rainbow Dam. Uh, which Bill is tied up in meetings on that, or he would be here tonight. So I will be getting you more details on the citizen science. And then also, if we need to, we will be advocating for funding to complete the energy efficiency upgrades and associated improvements at uh, the Quinnebog Hatchery. So it's kind of an exciting uh, exciting thing. And if you have any thoughts on the legislative committee, just reach out to me and I can discuss them or take them to uh, Bill Hyatt. Uh, I attended. Um, John? Yes. John, the, yep. um, and, and I'm sorry, um, uh, John, Stephen here, if you were going to bring this up, but I know at one of the FETU meetings, there was, as usual, there's always the concern about um, enforcement that comes up um, every year. Um, and it comes up in the Fisheries Advisory Council. But, um, you know, it came up in the FETU meetings and, you know, in, in, and I, I think that, you know, most chapters can agree that enforcement is an issue. Um, and so uh, I, I'm just throwing that out there that it was brought up in an FETU meeting. And, and it's something that the Fisheries Advisory Council would have some, some leverage on, on addressing. Yeah, and that, that's, this, is an arm of the, this is an arm of the Fisheries Advisory Council. So, um, but we, that's definitely something we will advocate for. And if you see any issues that you think we should get involved in, 
uh, please let me know. Any questions on that? Anything else? I just completed a survey to the League of Conservation Voters. Uh, I attended their online seminar last, but they did it over three days over the past two weeks. I didn't get to all of the sessions. I got to what I could. I had a couple of things come up. But the one that I got to was eye-opening in a bad way because they had somebody who's a former state rep who is very involved with the Humane Society. And most of her presentation was how fishing and hunting are sports that people aren't doing anymore and how great it was that they have introduced bills to ban the import of uh, hunting trophies from Africa, which I, you know, that's fine, you know, <clears throat> shark, uh, to ban the fitting, shark fitting and to ban the bear hunt. But what was repeatedly said over and over again was that, that, that this feeling that they have such a majority now against fishing and hunting that they can go after it. And in that vein, proposed very vaguely, you've probably all seen it on Facebook the past couple of days, is the proposed ban on possession of new fur in Connecticut. Now, what new fur is, I don't know. It's very vague. It is intentionally vague. Uh, I think a lot of people on this Zoom have been in touch with state reps. I have been in touch with state reps. And I will keep us all posted going forward on this because the fear is that this fur ban could affect fly shops and fly tires. So I will keep you posted on that as that progresses. Right now, it's uh, very preliminary and it is in committee and it, it might not get out of committee. But if it does, we're gonna have to be heard because my fear is that an unintended consequence of this, or I hope it's an unintended consequence of this, uh, may be uh, outlawing the sale of dubbing that any of us who tie use. So any questions on either of those? John, is there any way to find out who's on that committee? Environment, I'll get you that. Was that on the uh, website? Envir uh, the Environment Committee or the FAC Committee? Uh, the, well, the, the, committee, the committee that's taken up this proposed ban on the- Fur ban, I'll get you that. I'll get you that. I got a question, Jack. Yes. Um, I realize that this is a, this is a subject that that the vast majority of of our our membership and and would be cer uh, certainly opposed to because it would d directly affect you know fly you know the, the selling of flies and fly materials etc. Um, however, I question um, you know, I, I I initially found out about this through posts through I believe it was Farmington Valley and maybe even in one or two other chapters. Um, is this kind of us posting, or some of us, our chapters posting this to our, our Facebooks? Is this, a po is this in conflict with, um, to use policies against uh, taking political stances and expressing them? I mean, I realize it's the individual members that, that would be, a, that, you know, we're free to speak for our, our own opinions, but. I'll no, for legislative I mean, issues, it's not that, political. Yeah. yeah, this is this is this, this is, is a leg legislative issue. issue. Yeah, what I would raise is this, um, Carl. So, so completely allowed to do it. Um, you can't endorse. Well, not only you can't, you can't but endorse. What I wanted to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Alicia, that, that, what I was going to say was was that what you'll want to consider as a council and chapters is is this piece of advocacy aligned with the mission of Trout Unlimited? Um, or is this piece of advocacy better suited for an organization whose mission is, you know, related to, you know, the art of fly tying? Um, you know, our mission is to protect, reconnect, restore, and sustain the cold water fisheries. Um, you know, and so it, I'm not going to say that this, this isn't an issue that that impacts a lot of our members who choose to tie flies and who fish and, and, and things of that. 
but you know, and and there would not be any slapback, regulatorily speaking, from the IRS. You know, a case could be made that this is aligned with the mission. This is aligned with the sustained engagement part of the mission, right? Well, we teach fly tying to veterans and youth as a way to to build community, so we need access to these things. On a, from a marketing and perspective standpoint, I would say what the council and the chapter should consider is, does it paint uh, to you in the eyes of the general public as a fishing organization versus a conservation organization? And, and it's, it's, it's certainly fine to, 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 to decide that that's okay. Um, my, my, I would, the other thing I'd posit is this, if, if you did advocate on this issue, issue you know, let's make sure too, we get really active on advocacy on a lot of issues that are more closely aligned with our mission so that we start building a, a better, better case for, for cold water conservation being the purpose of the organization. Well, I, um, can I just say one quick thing about this? Um, again, you know, perhaps this is very small potatoes, but if they were to ban fur or other materials, then theoretically they, people would go to using artificial stuff, plastic. <laughs> Um, which would put plastic in the rivers, which would get back to the conservation of cold water fisheries and general pollution because, you know, obviously organic materials biodegrade. So I'm, I'm perhaps um, splitting <laughs> deer hair or whatever I don't know the expression, but you get the point. Splitting <laughs> wings. You're splitting wings here. Splitting wings. <laughs> no, I, you know, and it, it and it's, I don't know, this bill seems quickly written. It's very vague. I mean, you know, if you read it, it's going to impact just more than fly tires. It's going to impact anybody who makes wool sweaters in the state. It's going to impact anybody that tries to sell alpaca fleece in the state. So, um, you know, it, it, I, it, I don't know if it was vaguely written on purpose or what, or if it's going to get a lot of amendments, but it's, it's just, you know, Alicia's waving her hand. Go ahead. Alicia, I'll, g I'll give the floor. No, no, I'll wait, I'll wait till you're done. I just <laughs> no, I was just saying, it's just, been, you know, it's, it's, but yeah, and, and people are going to just order online out of state. That's all. Well, no, it's, it, but it's, I, I'm wondering about the possession in state, but you're right. And you have to worry about how it's going to affect the shops. Alicia? Um, I just wanted, because I've, I've seen um, not, not any Facebook posts from TU, but um, some other. Um, a Facebook post from another uh, fishing organization. And I'm just asking that if, if you do any advocacy, um, whether it be, um, you know, through a testimony on Facebook to, to let your, your membership know, just be careful how you're, you're phrasing this. Um, you don't want to make enemies of the Environment Committee. Um, what I saw on Facebook was a lot of dogging the Environment Committee for their, their, their pro-animal. And believe me, as someone who the last three years has been trying to, to testify on, you know, really solid environmental bills and, and most of the bandwidth being taken up with the animal rights bills and the environment committee, it's been frustrating. Um, you know, and, and I'm not dogging, you know, um, you know, anybody's priorities, but um, just re be really careful because, you know, from some other conservation organizations, you know, we, we do want to be viewed as a, a fellow conservation organizations and make our our side, you know, valid and, and not reactionary and not calling anyone names. So just just I'm just asking everyone to be cautious. I said something before. Um, I posted that on our website and I, I agree that, uh, you know, TU is not a, a fishing organization, but I think it's easy to say that most of our members are fishermen and fly fishermen particularly and i think if if they found out if our membership knew that we had information about this bill and we didn't pass it along to them i think we'd be making a lot of enemies and people would be looking to exit to you and go to other organizations to support their sport and uh and things they like to do i mean most of a lot of our members are fly tires and the rest of them may not tie flies but they but they fly fish um so when we get this type of information we're kind of obligated to pass it along. I'm not going to write a letter to my senator saying, you know, I'm so and so and I represent Travel Limited. But I think by letting our 600 members know that this bill is out there, you know, that's that many more people are voicing their opinions, hopefully, to their legislators one way or another. But, um, you know, that's why I put it on Facebook and I thought it was a good idea. I think it was the right thing to do. I think to this point, 
what I've seen, and believe me, getting back to the last agenda item, and I don't want to have to use my outdoor voice again, um, but getting going back to the prior agenda item, um, we just have to be careful what we post. And if the post is simply alerting our members to the existence of this bill, then I think we're doing our job and, and we're serving our members. And then we can go from there. As to, you know, I, I think we would get into trouble if we were advocating to vote against anybody who signed on to sponsor this. Then I think we're political. But I think to let people know the existence of this bill, I think we're within what we do. No, I would agree. And then it's up to individual people to decide where they stand and what they want to do about it. You know, we're not telling them one way or another where to stand, what to do. It's just awareness. And I certainly didn't raise this to, to, to say anybody was wrong in doing it. I was just, I was at, saying it more from the, the pers perspective of, of, I was hesitant to post this on our own Facebook page out of fear that it could be construed as political. That's a great, you know what you did the right thing you you had concerns so you paused and then brought it up in the proper venue um and i think just like i said alerting your, your members to the existence of this and who they can get in touch with to let their feelings be known you're not telling them what to say you're just performing the service for them of letting them know that something they do could be affected by legislation and telling them how to get involved in the process. And I think anything you can do to that to, to that goal is a good thing. And I think asking the question was right. Anything else on the fur ban proposal? Beth Peterson, you've got a land acquisition to uh, talk about. Uh, yeah, I guess I do. Um, <laughs> Last week, um, and this is where I feel like I'm skating on thin ice and kind of up in the air as to who should handle this and who should look at this. Um, last week, my sister, who's the president of the Avalona, oh, Avalonia Land Conservancy out of North Stonington, so this would be in the realm of Thames Valley's chapter, um, approached me. Avalonia is from what I understand, one of the larger land conservancies in the state um, and their acquisitions are huge. Um, I've honestly never seen a land trust that had as that that possesses as much land as they do. Um, they are looking at acquiring a property on the Greenfall River um, referred to as the sheep property. Um, it's 86 plus acres. It's on the Greenfall River. Um, Greenfall River has been uh, classified as a class one trout stream, although I'm kind of confused by that and there needs to be more research into that because I'm not completely sure about that. And even she, and she works with the, um, the state is not it's not completely clear as to what what class it is um they've managed to secure a three hundred thousand dollar grant to acquire this property the cost of the property property is three hundred and twenty five thousand so they have a twenty five thousand dollar shortfall um basically she got a hold of me to see if there was any way to you could help them or if we knew of any other avenues. Um, my answer to her was, I can look into it. Um, basically at this point, I was pointed by Lisa Baranak to the um, NLC's Land Conservancy Fund, which, and unfortunately I haven't gotten a whole lot of time to review what the guidelines are for the fund but from what i understand much like eas grants it's a matching fund grant and usually the highest grant they'll award is five thousand dollars which can be matched with in-kind 
um, donation or volunteer hours or any of those things. Again, something I need to look at more thoroughly. Um, at this point, it's a matter of, it does look like that needs to originate from the chapter, which I talked to Gary last week and didn't really see this until today when I had a minute to look at the guidelines. So that leaves us in a place where if Thames Valley would want to look into that project and would like to look and see what may happen, they want ultimately what Avalonia wants to do is on one specific part of this parcel, there is a good access point to build an ADA accessible fishing area. Um, and that's pretty much what they want to do. So again, this is something that I guess at this point I'm presenting to Thames Valley, if it would be something you would want to work with. Can I jump in? Sure. Uh, a little bit. I, I've been very active for 40 years with a large land trust here in Eastern Connecticut. Uh, as you know, I'm with James Valley. Uh, I did not, I'd have to go back and look. I'm, I'm very familiar with Avalonia, but didn't realize that they were very large. Uh, it was not my impression, but uh, nor did I realize, think that that stream was a class one. That was, was new to me when I saw the post. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, our a past president of Thames Valley is very active with Avalonia, has been for years. Uh, and uh, it would certainly uh, easy enough for, for us to uh, have a look and discussion about the situation that is there. I think uh, Gary and I can talk about it and, and, uh, and we, can, uh, we can approach the people at Avalonia and get a little better feel about what's going on. Um, but uh, as we have been involved with some other acquisition, acquisitions in, in the area and do, have been working with some land trusts. We haven't directly done anything recently with Abalonia. We did a few years ago, just some minor things, but uh, we're, I'm very familiar with them any, at any rate. Okay. In that case, I'll pass all that information along yeah, and um, I mean, will let my sister know to kind of push her stuff towards you. <laughs> well, in terms of TU, it should be in Thames Valley's pocket. Yeah. Absolutely. You have four Thames Valley board members on this meeting right now too, so. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought here on this, and I don't think I brought this up Saturday because I may not have thought of it, Beth. Um, if they want to do ADA accessible fishing there, have uh, what about wounded warriors what about healing waters what about casting for recovery what uh, any number of those organizations might want to be involved um i know that the myinnis chapter does an event with special olympics they might want and there you might have multiple sources of that money that might not have the hamstrings that uh that uh, some of the TU operations do. You understood. And yeah, and that's absolutely, again, unfortunately, all I've seen is the maps and some pictures. I don't even know if this is conducive to fly fishing at all. So I don't know if we would even, you know, aside from the conservation end of it, I don't know that this is even something that is within the scope of fly fishing. So, Again, I would really like to push it towards Thames Valley, kind of let you guys determine what you think is best. And like I said, suggest to her all of those things, all of those organizations. And honestly, they've never had a hard time um, fundraising before. I can't see, I think it's just more right now. It was a project that they got this $300 grant or $300,000 grant when Alicia was chairman because Alicia, you wrote a letter for them um, so years ago. 
and it probably just needs to be expended at this point. If anybody needs me or wants me to come out, if they get a chance to look at that property, I wouldn't mind driving out and having a look at it. Yeah. Right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go, Sal. I was going to say that it's, it's, it's not classified as a, as a wild trout management area uh, by oh. DEP. That doesn't mean that there's not populations there. Uh, a few years ago, I talked to Neil Hagstrom about maybe doing some restoration work on there. And he said that, that, that the Green Valley Falls stream actually does dry up in the summertime because there's a impoundment up above there that just has overflow. So the, so the stream down below uh, just dries out. So there's not really good populations or habitat in there. Uh, the area where the, the site is, is, is fairly wooded. Uh, and that's not to say if they purchased the parcel, they couldn't do something. But right now, uh, it definitely looked like it would take some uh, considerable work. And at that, I don't know if there'd be a ton of habitat and stuff there. It's definitely not like the Salmon River or something where you have really good access. You have good fishing. There's good habitat. There's good water. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll definitely touch base with Thames on this uh, and follow up. But I just wanted to throw that in since we we're on the topic. Just a reminder, I, we're not a fly fishermission group. We are a conservation group. <laughs> and we got to protect our headwaters. So I don't know what that runs into, but just, just throwing it out there. Long Island so, Sound. Yeah. So what I was, <laughs> was going to okay. say on, on this front is um, improving and protecting water quality never gets cheaper than preserving open space and development, right? So supporting open space development along headwaters is a powerful thing. I, I would talk to land trust about, I mean, especially if there's brook trout there, um, two things. Asking the state to stop stocking brown trout there. Um, they're a non-native invasive species and, 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 it, and, and working to remove dams and stuff, setting a long-term conservation strategy. You know, it's one of the things that, you know, <laughs> you know it's one thing to, it, it, it's one thing to remain quiet about, um, about long-term past uses that that impact, you know, our, you know, the, the protection of our native brook trout. It's an it's it's another to you know cooperatively support things that might encourage further degradation of, of native brook trout. Um, so so that's like I'm fully in support of marshaling the troops and 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 finding ways to help the land trust protect this piece of land and every other piece of land that that we can get our hands on to protect. But um, making it clear that our expectation is not the benefit of putting in a fishing platform and putting more stock brown trout in a pool for, for, for people to catch. This, you know, could brook be a, uh, brook uh, this could be a good project to involve the Native Fish Coalition on. That we could go in there with them together and say, we don't want it stocked and we want it preserved. I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah, and uh, so Gary uh, and, and gang, um, as you talk about it, I'll, I'll go back to the, the Mayanis chapter board um, and, and talk to them about if your chapter agrees to, to try to move forward with the Land Conservancy uh, grant of $5,000 and, and see if our board will approve a you know $2,500 uh, grant to your chapter to cover at least half of your match. Thank you, Jeff. On a similar note, not on the agenda, but this was just posted by Ron Murley after I sent the put the agenda out. Um, and this was posted by a realtor for Sotheby's. Uh, now up for sale on the Niantic River is 248 acres, including one mile of coastline. It's surrounded by a 400 acre nature preserve and they're selling the waterfront for development. Only a cool $40 million. So can we <laughs> scratch that up? We can have a little club over there or something? Yeah. Let's, let's, let, well, let's bite, yeah, bite off the $25,000. <laughs> While well, you're talking, the guys at my head is for money, Jeff. <laughs> nope. Is that a chunk of the uh, Oswagachi Hills by any chance? Uh, no, cl no clue. I don't know. It, it's, uh, Probably it's, like, is. it's the largest open space of... Connecticut shoreline left. I'm pretty sure it is adjoining Oswegatchie. Yeah. yeah, it must it must be. Okay, and then just 
by way of an update, um, we did comment uh, the council and uh, Nutmeg on Aquarian's plan to uh, seeking a 25 year permit to increase, how do I properly phrase this, Alicia? To in increase its with increase its draw from well it it's it, it increases doubles the tr the amount of water that can be transferred from the greater bridgeport system to the um the fairfield lower fairfield county uh region and there's another name for that but i can yeah. never get it right that's right that's it i just didn't know I, i'm never certain how to properly phrase drawdown withdrawal what have you we have uh, asked that they make uh, flow gauges and temperature gauges publicly accessible so they can be watched and so we can uh, contact uh, Aquarion or DEEP or both should there be any problems. Um, any new business? And Gary, you had an idea that you and I talked about uh, bringing up. We can do that real quick. Well, I. I yeah, last time Jack and I talked, I, I just kind of ran by an idea that I, I had been kicking around. At our last meeting, someone had talked about starting to share share Zoom meetings, and then over the last over the last couple of months, have you seen? As you've seen, we've been sharing some of our chapter meetings with CFFA and all the other chapters. We've been opening them up and inviting others. But I was thinking of taking that even a step further, a little more complicated, but I was, I was thinking that, you know, if, if chapters could actually get together and figure out how do we leverage and maybe combine meetings as opposed to just inviting each other to meetings, uh, that might be a good way. Like, like over the course of a year, a lot of us will probably hire the same speaker, you know, two, three chapters will get the same speaker. So it might have been a good opportunity now that we're doing this all on Zoom, if we could sort of get together and say, hey, I don't want, I, we all want to hire Steve Colton, for instance. And rather than three of us going out and spending the 300 bucks that takes them to get them in, one of us do it and combine our chapter meetings and, and have it at the same time. A little more logistics and planning. And I, and I thought about our own chapter where our, our attendance has been pretty kind of meager, about half of what it used to be on Zoom than, than what it was in person. So I don't know how well that would go over with any of the other chapters. So I, I thought of all the reasons why it might not work. But anyway, that was the idea we kicked around is, you know, could we actually leverage and combine some of our meetings and share speakers? Well, Farby to Valley Gary actually just talked about that. And, um, you know, and we, we've reached out and tried to, you know, with CFFA and other chapters saying, you know, we're, we're more than welcome to, to advertise other chapters, Zoom meetings, and ask the same for ours. Um, the one issue we came up with sharing, sharing member meetings like that is, uh, and, and I don't know if this goes for all chapters, but we do cover chapter business in our member meetings. So uh, it's a time for us to reach out to those members that do dial in and let them know what's going on that may not necessarily come to our board meeting. So, uh, um, you know, if you get two, three, four chapters and they all do that, you're tying up 45 minutes just talking right. business that guys don't want to listen to. So yeah, um, yeah that, that was what it, that was the biggest issue where we and then if you bring in CFFA, they're talking about their business as well. So that was the biggest negative point against that. But, um, you know, John had a drop off, but he definitely wanted to, 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 to say thank you to those chapters that have advertised us and to put it out that we will advertise any Zoom meetings of our other chapters that may be of interest because i think we all want to see you know other speakers so yeah like, like i said i mean it, it seemed like a good idea but then after we talked about it i mean i know there's a lot of pitfalls like you just brought up like how do you conduct your chapter business so that's why you don't combine them so i i mean it's, it's been a really good thing i think that the chapters have been sharing the zoom meetings with each other and with cffa i think that's been a great opportunity for us to at least see other speakers it'd be nice if we could take it a step farther but i mean this may be too complicated to do that i think it's worth gary, it I've, I've got a question Rick. Yeah. yeah gary i just wondered um are you able to tell if you're getting different members uh, of your chapter actually attending the zoom than usually attend the in-person um, I think for the most part, I don't think they're different members. I think it's a subset of the same members that used to attend in person or attending the Zoom meetings. I don't, I don't think we're getting any new people. I was kind of hoping for that in the beginning, but I didn't see any of that. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the things that we were hoping to do is, uh, 
you know, there's a few people that definitely don't come to the in-person meetings because they don't drive at night anymore, or it, it just doesn't work out for whatever reason. And, you know, I know I've seen one of those people uh, that's a member of Hammond Asset uh, at several of the other meetings, you know, CFFA or uh, others. Um, so at least one. I yeah. haven't really checked on a lot, but at least one. Thanks. Uh, can I jump in? I think, I, I think Gary said a really a good idea here. Uh, and let me take my thoughts on it. Rather than trying to combine chapters, why not start uh, with an, just to try out a special meeting through Zoom meeting through council which the chapters chip in a few bucks to sponsor a big name speaker and do it through council. Do it, we'll do a quarterly special program. Yeah, no, it, no nothing. That, that, yeah, that's a good idea because, you know, you got to think out of the box. We don't, these Zoom meetings don't have to be a chapter meeting. They could no. be a, a special, yeah. you know, and, and that's the thing. And and one of the other things we're realizing too is, is you know, I, I you know, we got we got a lot of gray hair here, and a lot of these folks don't have access to laptops. They don't know how, you know, they start getting in, and you know, and I and I got to apologize. Our last Zoom meeting was almost a, a disaster because we had problems with Zoom. But I mean, a lot of these people just don't know how to use Zoom, and you know, we're seeing, you know, we're missing a lot of people that normally come to our meetings and look mm -hmm. for that socialization, and that and that's why a lot of the numbers are down. I mean, look at the problem of people trying to get vaccine scheduling i mean they just don't know how to use laptops and, and get onto zoom meetings it's you got zoom fatigue too carl i mean I yep. yeah i'm so zoomed out yeah all day long or I, well i was before i got bought out but i i'm on zoom thanks jeff i'm on zoom all day long <laughs> yeah yeah you can only look at butch so long you know before you just <laughs> <laughs> Any new business on that note? <laughs> Butch lives close enough to me to come over and kick my ass, Carl. So let's. Uh, oh, let's black, man. <laughs> See, there goes there goes my chance for a trip to Roscoe. There it goes. <laughs> Any new business? Hey, uh, John. I just have one quick thing. Uh, yeah. I I'm currently in discussions with the uh, Quinnebog uh, Hatchery staff to uh restore the family fishing pond they have there oh. uh it need it needs a lot of work it's full of sediment and vegetation they don't have money to go in and do it so i'm in discussions with them to see if tu can obtain some funds uh and go in there and help them make some improvements to it you know tree brush clearing maybe putting a new water control structure in but i mean it, it's it's really a staple where some people go catch their first fish and i know it's not wild fish but i think getting young kids involved or families who only have you know half hour to go somewhere real quick i think it's really important uh you know and, and the hatchery does so much across the state that i doubt anyone wants them to stop doing what they're doing to fix the pond for a couple months so it i'm trying to work with the hatchery staff to do that but if anyone has interest in uh helping out or supporting that uh feel free to reach out and let me know and i can keep you on a list uh but you know moving forward we're look the hatchery as you mentioned does have some work going on uh coming up for the next year or so uh so this is not going to happen immediately but we may try to do some volunteer work to get at least ready for this april for people to go out and fish there but right now you, you can't even cast in it because there's so much vegetation in it uh and you can't even walk the shorelines it's not really accessible to to folks who aren't young and agile to walk through muck or tree branches so uh we'll on that list okay absolutely John. yeah sal can you make sure i'm on that list as well yep and it's like a council coordinated effort here i would be fine <laughs> with that I, yeah, yeah, I, I can keep you guys posted too we i did like a some rough concept sketches up to the hatchery and sent them over just to feel them out for for what level of effort you know they might be okay with and i have a meeting with them uh, on Friday out on site to to get a feel for for what avenue we want to go down and then after that I'll probably be looking for grant funding or or local sponsors or something to help us out and I do have two uh, state senators who are already on board to support that effort as well so 
hopefully we can we can fix it. I know that's where my son caught his first trout with the fly rod. So yeah, and just remember, just, man hours are free. So I mean, yep, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and that's what I'm hoping too. You know, a good outreach event uh, to folks and have the TU name on on a sign there at the pond, so when everyone's there fishing, they can do it, and you know, chapters can go there for fishing days or whatever. Uh, but the hatcher is really appreciative of, of TU support on that. So I'll definitely keep you guys posted. Yep. Sal, Sal, yep. uh, Sal just, just one quick idea on that. Um, occasionally the National Guard folks that still do construction type activities uh, will, will um, come out for a special project as a training. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, at least consider that as a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, the state technical high schools. Some of that work could be done by them. Yep. All right. And you could also probably tap into the ag high schools too, because I know most of them, if not all of them, at this point are now have they now have aquaculture programs. So that's another place that might be of some help. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, their, their pond right now is pretty small. So one proposal I had was actually doubling it in size uh, to make it more active for people. And also it's not very fly fishing friendly. So, <laughs> you know, I want to make sure it's good for anyone who, anyone who wants to go there and fish. And uh, I just, it's a great community project for TU to kind of get us out there in community and, and helping family and, and kids get active uh, in fishing and recreation like that. Yeah. Uh, uh that's why I was suggesting perhaps an entity with some heavy equipment that might uh, uh, be useful. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate it, Rick. Yep. About the local municipalities in that area, plus the state, they got all of that. We did, I, when I worked for the town of Wilton, we went in and redid one of the town parks. Yeah, yeah, the, the ta uh, definitely reaching out to, to the towns. I know the hatchery themselves, they do have some equipment. DEP has a whole wildlife division with heavy equipment too. Uh, so DEP might be able to help out with some matching contributions, they said, with heavy equipment if it's far enough down the road that they could, uh, you know, schedule it. Uh, but, you know, with, with budget crunches and stuff like that, uh, they really appreciate TU taking the reins because that's just not something they have time to focus on or manage right now. So I'll, I'll definitely keep you guys posted, but I appreciate all the input and everyone feel free to reach out to me directly uh, if you want to as well. I think we're all pretty interested in it, Sal. So let us know how we can help and, and we're there. Anything Absolutely. else? Absolutely, thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. All right, thanks everybody. Good night. Thanks, Take care. Everybody. Stay Stay safe. Safe. Thanks everybody. Keep Thank warm you, everyone. Weekend.